All right. Good morning. Good morning. Um, there is a heaviness definitely over us this morning. Um, so you're going to have to turn with me as I start from that to, to something more lighthearted for a minute. But I promise we'll get into sin as we go. Um, yeah, I know. Just making, you, making a promise to you. I'm going to back up a little so I can see everybody. Um, my first question is this morning, who loves a good makeover? Yeah? Who loves to watch a makeover? Whether it's they redo a house, they redo somebody, they redo a piece of furniture. I mean, I'm pretty captivated with that. And if you look at the lineup on HGTV and DIY and all the channels and even on morning shows, we love a good makeover, right? Um, we love seeing something that's broken down, that's ugly, that's useless, and see it transformed into something beautiful and timeless and um, just something that was ready to go to the dump, basically, or be demolished, change into something wonderful. And so I think the best makeovers are the ones, you know, that start with the before that's really bad. Like you've seen... You know, you see them pick people off the streets to do a makeover, but you know that they must have, like, taken a makeup wipe out there and had them take it all off and put their hair back in a ponytail or something. The best makeovers start when you see how bad something is before it's transformed. And then the hairdressers, the makeup artists, the stylists, the DIYers all come in, right? They do all their work, and by the end, we get the big reveal, and we get to see this jaw-dropping transformation that we almost can't believe. We love it. Uh, we love that last picture of that comparison, right? The before, you know, worst light ever, and the after. Probably with a filter, I don't know, but before and after. And we're inspired when we see those things, aren't we? We're like, I want a before and after. Like, you go home and start looking around at what you can do, what you can change. Or, I'm going to get that product that they talked about. Um, well, if you think about it, uh, Romans has been a before and after scenario really for us as believers. Um, so far, we have spent a lot of time and a lot of verses with Paul reminding us of our before, who we are at our worst. And he has really, like, done that for us, hasn't he? I mean, we spent a whole week talking about our sinfulness. That's our before. So I want you all to shout out with me, what are some of the things that we were in our before? I'm sorry? Liars. Prideful. Jealous. Coveting, yes. Boastful. What about in our relationship with God? What were we? Enemies. Separated. Apathetic. Hopeless. That was our before. So we really started in a place that there was a lot of work to be done. And last week we got to celebrate because Paul finally transitioned from our sinfulness to God's ability to make us righteous and redeemed. And we got to the work part of the makeover, right? But what Paul made us really realize is we had nothing to do with that. We came in and sat in that chair and let God do all the work. He did it. He's the one who transforms us. And he over and over drove home that truth, that the makeover in us only happens by grace through faith. If we don't have that at this point, I don't know what we've done. It is by grace through faith that we are redeemed. And not because of anything we can do or earn, but because of the supernatural work of God. We need to own that before we go any further, that that's what we're basing everything on. So this week, I kind of felt like we got to the big reveal. We knew how bad we were. We saw how great God was to change us. And this week, we kind of got a picture of what we look like now. And we picked up in Romans 5.1, and it said, Therefore, sin, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. This week we reached this after, who we are in Christ. Chapter 5 even started with that word, therefore, meaning if you look back at all this that we have talked about, 
and draw a conclusion. Consequently, according to this, this is who you are. And so your first point on your handout is that through faith in Christ, we have received an eternal makeover of our hearts. And this is Old Testament consistent, New Testament consistent. He said he was going to do it, and now we've seen it happen through Jesus. We've received an eternal makeover of our hearts. So now if we had to say who we are, if we had to name who we are in our after, we just named who we were before, who would you say we are in our after? Kinder. Saints. Free, yes, yes. What about our relationship with God? Child of God, restored. If you look back in five uh, one, there's words like um, gained access, right? Peace with God. We stand in His grace. This is our after. Paul has finally gotten us to this point, and the Bible describes it in lots of places, in Paul in lots of letters, over and over about this transformation. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 20 says it this way. Therefore, another one, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed us to this message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. I think now when I read all the letters Paul wrote, I'm going to catch this, that he, this is his heart. This is his mission, is to tell people that God has changed them. And our makeover doesn't just make us look better or act better or be more appealing to people. It does those things, but what it mostly does is transforms us into something totally new, right? From the inside out in our hearts. It affects our motivations, our attitudes, hopes, dreams, goals. Think about this change. Think about this transformation. It changes everything in your life. And Paul made it clear that we are not going to ever be that before again. This is not a maybe or a goal that he wants us to become this, he states as fact in God's word that this is a truth for now. Present tense verbs, you are these things. So after reminding us of our sin, assuring of us of our redemption by grace through faith, Paul now this week turned to the practicality of the matter. How do we live in light of this change? And in our makeover scenario, this is the part where the homeowner or the individual has been made over, and they're turned back over to living their life. I mean, do you ever think about what happens after that show ends? <laughs> they're really needing to take the tools and the skills and the build on all the things that were done for them, right, and live differently. Um, I picture after the show, you know, them asking questions. If it's a beauty makeover, what did you use? How did you do this to my hair? Da, da, da. If it's a home makeover, you know, I expect that there's probably instruction about, now when you get home at the end of the day, you know, I, you need to clean this up. You need to put this away. Here's the bin for this. Here's the bin for that. Um, maintaining the change is the next challenge. And it's really the next challenge for us, too, in our transformation. So what would that look like? What would we live like in our picture of this eternal makeover scenario? The question is, how do we take what we know about our makeover, about what God's done, about salvation, and how do we live in the reality that we really are a new creation? Remember, right now, not you're going to be. Yes, we're going to be transformed again when Jesus comes back, but we are already transformed to live differently now. So how do we take what's changed and maximize living in the fullness of what has changed in us? Because the truth is, old habits die hard, right? Um, we know that a makeover doesn't always take. People go back to old habits, even if they know that there's life, hope, confidence, possibility, and joy in the made-over them or the made-over home. I thought about that show, Hoarders. Has anybody ever watched it? I mean, yeah, like almost can't. 
Although there's parts of my house that I go, this is me. Uh, this, uh, this is my hoarder room. Um, I don't know if you've ever watched where they follow up with the hoarders. I mean, they've cleaned everything out. They've given them a fresh start. I know they've told them what to do, but there's something in those people. And a lot of times it's abandonment or, or issues of hanging on to things, real things. But they go right back to what they were doing before. And their life looks exactly like it did. The transformation did not take. The makeover didn't take. So the reality of transformation is that whether it's a makeover or a home reset, or even you see people do this in relationships where they kind of get a reset and they're going to step forward, but they don't make the changes. If you don't change your habits to feed the new circumstance, then life will gradually drift right back to where we were looking totally unchanged. So we need to realize this morning there's some action involved in dropping the old and picking up the new. The salvation was totally God. But what we do with it, we bear some responsibility in. Paul has really taken us to the crossroads of every person's transformation story. I mean, we're seeing it here as he says it in Romans. But this is all of our stories. Think about crossroad moments of your life. When you got married, maybe uh, graduated college, started a job, um, had a baby, got all your babies out of the house, maybe lost a spouse or a family member. All those are crossroads moments where the circumstances of your life changes in a way that you can't step forward from that moment and be the same ever again. You've got to find a new way to live. And you make decisions in those moments. This is how I'm going to do this based on what has changed in my life. So for us as believers, we hit that crossroads moment when we decide to accept Christ. We are changed. Our circumstances are never the same again. And we have some choice, we still have free will in deciding how we're going to live from then on out. And that's where Paul had us this morning. Because he knows if the receivers of this letter to the Romans are going to be effective bearers of the gospel for God, that's, what he, that's their purpose, right? To spread this word. If they're going to do that effectively for the kingdom, then Paul wants to make sure they get this right. That they step into their makeover day one doing this the right way. And because our transformation story lies in that, it's important for us too, these same words. So Paul's making sure that they and we are fully aware of our new circumstances, and he's guiding us and them in how to live in these new creation circumstances. That's what we're kind of thinking about. We're a new creation. These are new creation circumstances. So let's pick up in Romans 5, 20, and we're going to read through 6, 2. And really, chapter 6 is where we're going to sit this morning and I've got uh, the verses that we're focused on on the back of your handout. So if you, I'm going to put them on the screen, but also I wanted you to have them in front of you. So 520 through 62, I don't have 520 on there, but the law was brought in so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace also increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that's what was said right before the big questions that we picked up in chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? I promised you we were going to get to sin, and here we are. Justification has clearly been defined as unearnable. But that sets up the opportunity for misinterpretation right off the bat. Paul knows that where these people's brains and where our brains go. Paul wastes no time in dealing with the issue of error. It's an error to think that this new freedom the believer has through Christ means that they, the law can be ignored and that sin can be disregarded because God's great grace has redeemed us. That's their thinking. At the crossroads of dying to the old self and walking as a new creation through grace, we find Paul dealing with two issues, freedom Whoever shouted out free earlier, you're right with me. Freedom, but also responsibility. That's kind of where he's at with them this week. And I thought about where that has hit me in my own life. Um, has anybody ever taught a child to drive? <laughs> or three? <laughs> um, I saw one of my friends post, and he's on his last child teaching, him to drive, teaching her to drive, and he's like, these are not the days they said you would miss. I'm like, no, they are not. 
So you teach them to drive, and you get them all ready, and you, you know, you've kind of done all you can do for them, and then what do you do? You buy them a car, right? And you stand there with that car, and you know that their life's never going to be the same, and neither is yours. There is a new set of circumstances that they are living in that gives them a whole lot of freedom. And the fear is that that freedom leads them into making bad choices. So what do we do? We sit them down, we say, okay, as, as part of this household, as part of the Woodham family, this is how we conduct ourselves with a car. This is what's expected of you. Let me spell it out for you before you make a mistake and say you didn't know. Let me make my expectations clear. Let me make sure you know the reality that exists around this freedom so that you can live in the abundance of all that driving has for you. Now, that we're laughing at that, but that's true as a parent, right? You want them to be able to drive. I mean, it set me free in a lot of ways when my kids could drive. You want them to step into the world and be able to make choices where they go and do the things God wants them to do. And this is a tool for doing that. You want them to live in the abundance of the freedom. But you know there are borders and there are limits and there are lanes they need to stay in literally and figuratively as a driver. Sadly, the freedom granted to us by grace was and continues to be misunderstood. And it is also an issue of freedom and responsibility. And Paul hits it right here. After he made sure they knew they were bathed in grace, he knew what their next human tendency might be, would be to step into sin. Paul's critics said that the setting aside of the law and works for salvation means that there's also a reason to set aside holy living. That's basically what they were bringing up. They wanted freedom without responsibility. And many of our kids probably wanted that same thing. Their question was, if my sin causes grace to abound, then why don't I just continue to sin? Basically, their argument was that the more I sin, the better God looks. So why would I stop sinning? I want God to look good. I know it seems ridiculous, doesn't it? But this is, this is how our brains work. It's this total misuse of God's grace that Paul addresses as he moves forward in 6. He's sitting them down like we did with our teenage new drivers and making sure that they are aware of the responsibility of this new freedom, of this transformation. He's saying to them, as part of God's household, here is how we conduct ourselves with this freedom. Let me spell it out for you before you have a chance to mess up and say you didn't know. Let me make God's expectations clear. Let me make sure you know the reality of circumstances that exist around this new freedom so that you can live in the abundance of it, but within borders of safety and blessing and what's best for you and will glorify God the most. Freedom and responsibility. Now, there's a part of us that might view this section of Scripture as not really applying to us. I mean, you might say, well, I don't take God's grace for granted. I don't try to sin to make him look better. Um, and there's another part that might go, oh, I knew the rule part was coming after all this. Talk about faith. Like, there's a little bit of a, oh, here's the do's and don'ts. Uh, but when I came to this chapter this week, I realized there's so much more here than either one of those things. There's a new reality that exists for us as believers. Because grace sets us free to live the holy life we are called to live. And yep, that's the next point on your handout. Because of that grace that now they're now wanting to turn away from living holy, it's the exact opposite. Grace gives us freedom to live the holy life we're called to live. In this passage, we have the very basis for our ability to live a holy life. So in our makeover, if we're going, okay, well, what's the first thing I need to do? The first thing we need to do is realize that grace sets us up to do this. It's possible. To the hoarder, you really can stop collecting things. To the low maintenance person who, who wants to get up and look different. You really can get up and do these things. You really can change. So Paul is leaving the realm of justification, right? That's where we've been, where we're legally declared righteous because of what Christ has done, and he's moving into sanctification as we look at f chapters 5, 6, and 7. And Kim mentioned this last week, and I went ahead and put the definition. Um, I think definitions have been important in this study, and that's the next blank on your handout. Sanctification. And that's defined as the continual process whereby we are being made holy or set apart by the Spirit who lives within us. This is a big church word, but the meaning of it is really awesome. 
I love that it says it's a continual process. Sanctification is a, a very important part of the new creation life. It's the progressive work of God to make a believer more like Jesus. It's the actual atmosphere of our after. We can't look at our before and after without realizing that we are now living in this period called sanctification. We are living in a process whereby we are being made holy. So Paul is instructing these believers to live in a period of sanctification. Because sin continues to wage a war against us, right? Temptation will come, and even though Satan's temptations can't in themselves control us anymore, they can kind of push us into yielding. So how do we deal with sin and handle temptation as a new creation? Romans 6, 11 through 14, I think provides three practical steps. I mean, this is what we're always looking for. Just tell me what to do. We, Paul's doing that. He says, in light of everything I've said, here's what you do. Let's read 11 through 14 and look at how we live in the sanctification phase. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under law, but under grace. If we're going to break it down to practical steps, we're going to go ahead and call this step one. Know that you are dead to sin and alive to Christ. The first step in living as a new creation is knowing, knowing the truth that we are dead to sin. The sin nature we inherited from Adam that is talked about at the end of chapter 5 is no longer in authority over us and our lives. Sin no longer has control over our wills and we are no longer its slave. I watched the video, and some of you may have two of our author, and, and she also ended up focusing on this section. Um, and one of the things she said that I loved is that we are under new management in Christ. Have you ever seen a, a restaurant or something that kind of is just not going well and gets run down? Then you see that sign that says, under new management. And you know everything's changed, right? Or you hope that under new management means everything's changed. We're under new management. And she said this, in Christ, our relationship to sin has completely and radically changed. Our relationship with sin is fully made over when we accept Christ and receive the Holy Spirit. And I think it's important for us to realize what this means because I think when we think about being saved or we look back on conversion, so many people just think about that and it's part of it, that relief of going, whew, I'm not going to hell, right? Free from the penalty of sin. But justification through faith in Jesus not only sets us free from the penalty of sin, which is death, it also sets us free from the power of sin. That power that will lead our wills into making choices that contradict the will of God. And as I studied this week, there really was new depth here for me. I knew these things in my head. I thought back and I know without a doubt that when I accepted Christ um, out of the summer camp in 1985, that I was forever free from the wages of sin. I was forever free from death's control over me. But I'm guessing that within the next hour or five minutes, I probably committed a sin. Or two. <laughs> because what I didn't realize then is that although I would still struggle with committing sins, the reality, the fact, the truth, the absolute was that I would never again live under sin's power. I was no longer sin's slave. This is, was a fact, not something that was going to happen. In that moment, I was no longer sin's slave. So how does this work? I want you to open your workbook to page 110 because there's a section where we would have listened to her teaching and filled out that I want to give you the answers for. And we're not going to cover this deeply, and there is, like, this got my brain spinning. So you might want to talk about it later or talk about it in your group. So page 110, it's that little box at the top. Everybody find it? These are the answers. This is kind of our author's 
interpretation of our relationship with sin through the phases of, of the kingdom, of God's relationship with us. So in creation, we were able to sin, right? They were able to sin the whole time, even when they weren't sinning, because they had free will. So the ability to sin existed. Then when the fall rebellion happened and they sinned, from that point on, and we saw this supported kind of in chapter 5 where we talked about the first Adam and how sin came in. From that point on, we were not able to not sin. Not able to not sin. And I might have put the blank in the wrong place on that one I'm looking at now. Not able to not sin. Because why? Through one man, Adam, sin came to all, right? The scripture said that. From that point on, we weren't able to not sin. Then redemption came. And that's where we are this week. We're talking about what Jesus accomplished. And we are now able to not sin. Because of these very words we just read. We are dead to sin. It's penalty and it's power. Now, that's, was that hard for anybody to write down or think about? I'm able to not sin. But I know I sin. There's a tension here. In the new creation, when we are fully restored, fully redeemed... We will not be able to sin. Not able to sin is where we're going. But we're not there yet. Because we're in sanctification. And sanctification comes before restoration. So we got to live here for a minute. Able to not sin. But still choosing to because free will still exists in us. The question I ask myself, and I want to ask you this morning, is do you believe that you are dead to sin's power? Not penalty. I know lots of us will quickly say, yes, I'm going to heaven. And if you don't know that, it's just as true. But do you live and believe that you are dead to sin's power? Or do you address sin as something you're powerless to overcome this side of heaven? I mean, I've said it myself, and I've heard us say it in group. And in lots of groups. Well, you know, I'm just never going to overcome sin until this, you know, this side of heaven. There's a little bit of that attitude in that. I'll just go on sinning so that grace may abound. I can't help it. And I want us to realize this morning, we can help it. We can't stop at 100%, but we can get better. And that's, remember, what sanctification is. Moving on that continuum towards restoration. I want us to realize that whether we feel like we are no longer under sin's power or not, God's word says we are dead to sin. This is not about how I feel about sin or whether I can overcome it or not. God's word said I died to sin and you died to sin. It's not wishful thinking. It's not hoping. It's not waiting for it to come to be. It is true now. We're talking about this new creation self. The new creation self is living free from the power of sin. In our after, we never have to look at sin the same way, ever again. Because God's word says our sin nature died when we united ourselves with Christ. Those two things are tied together. When we united ourselves with Christ, that's what brought about this death to sin. So if you would flip your hand out over, we're going to look at Romans 6, 1 through 11. And there's three pictures, I just kind of want to, I'm not going to camp on this, but I want us to realize that this is how God, this is how the scripture kind of explains, God gives Paul to explain how he sees us as dead to sin and how we actually are dead to sin. Um, I'm going to start in verse 3. Don't you know that all of us were baptized into Christ Jesus? We're baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with him in death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection, resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. There's three pictures here that he shows about this relationship and this death to sin. Anybody catch what the first one was? Baptism. At conversion, we're spiritually baptized by the Holy Spirit, and then hopefully we all took that next step and were baptized with water, showing this outward sign of what happened internally in us. 
God's word says that we were buried with him in, through baptism into death and then raised from the dead. The second picture here is that of crucifixion. You know, we say Christ carried our sins. We say Christ did this for us. This passage should give us a little bit more depth into that of going, in God's eyes, this part of me died with Christ. When he was up on that cross, he carried that part of me, and that part of me died when he died and then was raised. And the last picture is of slavery. And this is a picture that they got probably more than we get because they were living in the middle of it. But this picture that you do not have a master over you that controls you anymore. You get to make choices on your own. The three pictures are baptism, crucifixion, and slavery. What's the reality, the implication of that? Because I'm really wanting us this morning to get, if you had not figured that out yet, that we are dead to sin's power, and that, ma- that matters. That changes how we live. We need to know that when Christ died, we died with him. When he was crucified, our sin was crucified with him. When he was buried, we were buried. When he was raised, we were raised. When we united ourselves with Jesus and received the Holy Spirit, sin's power died. That is a fact. Colossians 2, 11 through 14, and again, I said, you can just, you see this repeated over and over by Paul. So consistent. Two, Colossians 2, 11 through 14 says, In him you were also circumcised with the circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him into baptism, which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of the flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. As far as God is concerned, when we united ourselves with Christ, our inability not to sin died. Allowing us to live a resurrected life with Christ, not for someday, but for right now. That's where that able to not sin section came in. And if something dies, I mean, we know aside from Jesus, it can't be resurrected. Its power is dead and we never have to serve it again. Our reality is that if sin's power over us has died, we are now empowered by God instead to overcome sin in every aspect of our lives. But we can't just know this. You know, that first point on there was that we have to know this. We have to know this is fact. But knowing something and doing something with that are two totally different things. Remember the freedom and the responsibility. I know I'm free, but what's the responsibility of this? I want you to look again at verse 11. It says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Look at the wording here. This is where we find our next practical step. Step number two, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So we've established that it's a fact we're dead to sin, but verse 11 adds in these two words, count yourselves. And that's very important because knowing we're dead to sin and living in the reality of that are two different things. So I gave you the word, the Greek word, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, for count yourselves. But the word is also reckon is a good word to think about there. Reckon yourselves dead to sin. And I gave you a couple, three or four lines if you want to put some of these down as far as what that word means. If we're going to reckon ourselves dead to sin, that word means consider, compute, calculate, take into account, weigh, meditate on, something that has force and weight, count up or weigh the reasons, deliberate, by reckoning up all the reasons to gather or infer. So reckoning is not just claiming the promise that I'm dead to sin. It is acting on that fact. It's not just hoping something is true and continuing to act as if nothing has changed and I can't stop sinning. It's knowing the truth and believing it enough to let it affect how I live and in this case, how I respond to when I'm tempted to sin. 
So practically, counting ourselves dead to sin means that when temptation comes, we need to, these same words, weigh, meditate on, consider, take into account, measure. There's a lot of logic in this. This is where we come in. We need to say, I have the ability to not sin. That's what counting ourselves dead to sin does. We let the truth of that motivate us in the moments where we either believe we're powerless against sin or when we convince ourselves that sin is not that big of a deal. It's just part of life until we get to heaven. We need to stop living like we can't do anything about it. We need to count ourselves as not powerless anymore. So we know we are dead to sin. We count ourselves dead to sin. And the third instruction comes in Romans 6, 13 through 14. Those verses say, Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law but under grace. Because of knowing sin is powerless over us, counting ourselves dead to it, the outward way we live should change. We must yield our bodies to God's control. Now, this comes up a lot in these letters, and one place is in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, and you, you're going to know this verse. Do you not know that your bodies are the temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. The word yield means I give up the right of way. And in those moments where we're tempted to sin, isn't that really the issue? Because giving up the right of way involves some freedom that we have, but some responsibility. Even as I pull up to a yield sign, I have the freedom to go. But my responsibility is to look around and see what the circumstances are before I make that move. And sometimes it means I stop. Because we are dead to sin, because of our makeover in Christ, we are now able to yield ourselves to God's control and his will and actually overcome sin progressively as we are sanctified. I hope you're catching it. We have the power to overcome these daily sins that we're faced with. Um, I study a lot of science when I was in college, and I'm, I love it. And I just kept thinking about potential and kinetic energy when I was thinking about this. It just kept coming up in my brain. So I just jotted it down, and it just stayed with me. Um, potential energy is energy that's stored in an object due to its position. And our potential energy position here is that we're dead to sin, right? But we're not just dead to sin. We're filled with something else, right? What are we filled with? Okay, and I haven't blown this one up yet, so. I may pass out. Okay, that one's not going to blow up. Imagine I blew this one up, okay? That Holy Spirit has filled us, right? It's potential. There's this potential for this to do something. But the truth is, if I tied this and dropped it to the floor, what's it going to do? I mean, it's just going to sit there. Is the possibility for that what's in there to be active and move? Yes. But I've tied it off. I've set it aside. I'm saved. I'm free from the penalty of death. Now, kinetic energy is energy that a moving object has due to its motion. It's the decisions and choices that we make based on the power of this potential energy that exists in us now after this makeover due to the Holy Spirit and being free from the power of sin. I blew that one up ahead of time. The Holy Spirit fills us with the potential to overcome sin. The potential energy. But to turn this potential energy of the Holy Spirit powering, giving us power, and moving it into practicality, there must be an action. Because if I stand here and hold this potential, it'll stay in here. And, I mean, it'll leak out, right? Little bits will pop out every once in a while. But if I decide to release the potential energy, it moves. It moved the balloon. It changed. It changed what was a potential into something that actually made a difference. We must take an action. It's not just enough to know that we're dead to the power of sin and that we're filled with the Holy Spirit. 
that free will part of us still gets to decide, am I going to live in the Holy Spirit's power or am I going to, am I going to cave and just live before my makeover like I did then? Galatians 5, 17, 22, and 23, and I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. It says, the old sinful nature loves to do evil, which is just opposite from what the Holy Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite from what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. And your choices are never free from this conflict. But when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, he will produce this kind of fruit. This is the kinetic energy of the Holy Spirit's potential. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Here there is no conflict with the law which is what Paul's trying to tell them, right? Through the power of the Holy Spirit and reckoning in our minds that we can overcome sin, we can overcome sin. Resisting temptation to sin is possible. That's what I want you to know this morning. We can resist sin. Will we do it perfectly? No. Does God expect us to? No. That's why this whole concept of sanctification is even in the word. Does that mean we quit trying? No. By no means. God is concerned with what we do with these bodies based on our makeover. He wants us to become less sinful as we are sanctified. Less making sin choices is really a better way to say it. Because we all know we're righteous in his eyes. Um, Here's a quote that I loved, and I'm going to finish up. um, From Bible.org, they have a series on the book of Romans. And um, the person that wrote this section said it this way. You might ask, Why is God so interested in our bodies anyway? 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, which we read, reminds us our bodies are the temple of God, and he wants to use them for his glory. He wants to use your body to build the kingdom. The Bible gives numerous examples of people who have permitted God to use their bodies to fulfill his purposes. God used Moses' hands to hold a rod and deliver his people from bondage in Egypt. He used Paul's feet to travel across Europe from city to city and his mouth to proclaim the good news of the gospel. He used John's eyes to see visions of the future. His ears to hear God's message and his fingers to write the various books that he penned. And God wants to use our bodies in the same way, to minister, to love, to teach, all to accomplish his will and his purpose on earth. And And she wasn't listed, but... God used Mary's womb, her body, to carry his son. God is interested in what we do with our bodies, what we say, what we think. The things that we think, this is just a sin, it's my personality. I'm just never going to be free of it this side of heaven. I'm not going to stay here long because... We are not done with this. Paul is not done with this. He's just kicking it off this week. Um, Romans 8 is going to talk about living through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Romans 12 is specifically talking about how to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. But I want you to know what Romans 8.37 says that's coming up for you this week. It says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. There is a victory here. We are dead to sin, and there are many, not many, little, I'm talking little, there are many victories to be had against sin from the moment you leave here until the moment you're in heaven. There are victories to be won. So I'd ask you as we leave, how much confidence do you have in the idea that sin is conquerable? Not overall, but those individual personal sins that you struggle with every day. How much confidence do you have? that those things are conquerable. I hope you have more confidence in that than you did before we got into Romans 6. And I want you to move out thinking, what would it look like if in the actual real moments of our lives, of mine and and of yourself, ask yourself, what would it look like in my life if when I'm tempted to sin, I reckon that sin is dead and I release the energy of the Holy Spirit in myself? Do I believe I can overcome that sin? Am I willing to try is probably the bigger question. 
And I put this statement at the end of, the bottom, at the end of your paper, and I just want you to, to leave you with that. You are free from the power of sin. Live like it. Live like it. Let's pray, and then I'll let you go. Hash it out in small group. Uh, Lord, I just thank you so much for the journey you've had us on of uh, showing us how bad we were, how good and able you are, and then not leaving us there to figure out what this freedom means, but telling us this is the best way to live. And I pray that as we continue in this study, we would not just close our books and walk away, but we would actually be changed, that we would actually today put this into practice as we're faced with temptation to sin, and that we would release your Holy Spirit's power in us to begin refining something out of our lives, whatever it is individually we struggle with. The power to do it rests in you, and we lean on that and we claim that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.